Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, and we have an amazing guest today, a good friend of the show, one of the real good guys, uh, one of the best mob busters the feds have ever had, Giovanni Rocco, former uh, FBI undercover agent, is joining us. First time uh, that we've been on, you since we've been on YouTube, he was uh, a guest when we were just uh, audio. But uh, Giovanni, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and uh, share some stories, share some insight, and talk about what you're doing today and some of the stuff that we're doing together at the Mom Museum. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having me back, Scott. I appreciate it. And congrats on the new platform. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, we're growing out here every day here at uh, YouTube and, and trying to be as multimedia friendly as possible. Um, but, you know, we took a... We had about a month where we weren't doing a ton of interviews, long form interviews, and and Giovanni is the is the kickoff to what I'm calling, you know, a uh, a, a late 2024 uh, interview rush where we're going to be putting out um, a bunch of exclusive type interviews, um, a lot of guys that you've never seen before. And we're going to do a bunch of them between now and the end of the year. And I couldn't be more amped to start with Giovanni. Um, so G- and I'm, I'm going to just literally give you 10 seconds and then hand it over to Giovanni. But uh, Giovanni, for people that might not know, uh, went undercover in the Decavacante crime family, the real life Sopranos uh, out of New Jersey and got as deep as you can go uh, with uh, that type of uh, federal infiltration got very close to a uh, New Jersey mafia capo, Charlie the Hat Stango. Got proposed to get his button and um, took down the 2010s. Basically, the whole kind of a big part of the structure of that family got brought down because of uh, his work. And then he's written a book, Giovanni's Ring, which is a, an amazing account of. Uh, of his 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 uh, trials and tribulations and and so Giovanni, give kind of let's take us from the start when you when you first learned uh, the tricks of the trade and how to kind of be a wise guy without actually being a wise guy. Right, right. Trials and tribulations. You hit it right on the head, Scott. Mm-hmm. A lot of them going up through throughout my career and throughout my life. Um, early on, I became very familiar with the mafia, having grown up as Hudson County kid in New Jersey. I was born and raised right outside of Manhattan. So Bayonne was my city where I was born and raised. So you can imagine in the 70s and 80s, there was a ton of activity uh, with all five families, you know. Um, so I grew up in that in playing in the backyards of made guys, going to school with family members of the mob. And I had a very uh, familiar um, education before I even came on a job. I was very drawn to that life. I think I worked in a lot of restaurants and I did a lot of work that familiarized me with them also. Just their mannerisms and everything. You, you, in my neighborhood, it was you, you, you're either cop's kid or, or you're a mob guy's kid. You know, somewhere in the middle, there were some business people, but everybody seemed to get along in the community that we grew up in. And we all respected each other, no matter what side of the aisle you were on, at least from what I saw growing up. So I had that balance and I would jump back and forth. I'm third generation law enforcement. So I had my dad, my 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 grandfather's side. My uncles were cops. My brothers wound up being a cop. Um, so I had that familiarity. But as a kid, I was drawn to the dark side. I loved I loved being in the street. I loved street fights. I loved hanging out with the bad eggs. Um, I was drawn to that because of my mom's side of the family. I had a little sprinkle of organized crime on the biker side. I had the outlaw biker gangs that a couple of my uncles were associated with and members of. So I had that understanding as well. I was drawn to that as, at a young age. Um, although I thought I wanted to be a, a law enforcement and a police officer, I never thought I could aspire to be that. I never thought I would. I didn't think I'd live past the age of 25, to be honest with you. I was told at a very young age I'd be dead or in jail by 25. So, you know. Beat the know. odds. What's that? <laughs> you beat the odds. I beat the odds, man. Yeah, I did. And uh, by the skin of my teeth sometimes. So I took everything that, um, that I learned in the streets as a kid. You know, and again, I, I defied authority um, the way I even when I, the way I went to school, it all kind of attributed to my undercover life and my covert world when I became a law enforcement officer. But in 1990, I got the job of being a cop. I worked in uniform for a while. Uh, very quickly, I, I gained my gold shield and I became a detective. 
um, because of the aggressive mannerisms that I had with my partners in the street. Uh, the things we were doing made a lot of mistakes, man. I'm like Frankenstein. I've been sewn together. I have my eyelids sewn back on. I've been stabbed on the job. I mean, you know, just crazy stuff has happened. Just, you know, my shoulders, my knees, my back. I've been cut out of cars and long before that. So the, the crime scenes, it, it all added to what I was doing as an undercover. Because, again, if I had to do a murder for hire, it was nothing for me to walk into a homicide scene and see multiple bodies or body parts of family members chopped up or, you know, some of the most horrific things you want to see as a human being. So I, I used that all to my, my tradecraft later on. Um, I was given the opportunity to work for the DEA in the early 90s. Uh, I was welcomed onto a DEA task force. I was there for a number of years. I took a break for a little bit because I got myself into some pretty hairy situations, having no official training. It's just everything I learned in the street, I took it and applied to it as my undercover life. Um, I remember my first undercover, my AFID, we call them, the alias false identification. I bought my first AFID, my first license uh, in Times Square, you know, in 1992, I think it was. And I went over to Times Square and, you know, that's what we did as law enforcement. We went over there and I went down into the basements there and I bought a fake license and that's what I used. Um, but I learned my tradecraft much later on when the FBI came calling. That's when my true tradecraft and my art of deception started. That's what I refer to it as, the art of deception. I'm not a liar. By, I'm not a professional liar. Uh, I'm not an actor. You know, a lot of people say you have to be a good actor. That yeah, is a little bit of sprinkle for the emotional side of that. But it really is the art of deception. Um, once the FBI got a hold of me, I went and did their training. Um, from that point on, I could do criminal cases or foreign counterintelligence. They actually trained you to do the basic minimum undercover work all the way to being a foreign counterintelligence officer. So one day you could be buying dope in the street. The next day you'd be trading secrets with some other agency. So it was crazy. It's crazy life. How did you craft your kind of signature undercover persona and get, you know, uh, assigned to uh, infiltrate the DiCavacante clan? Yeah, so um, good question. I mean, I guess early on, like every narc, right? Every narcotics officer, what's the first thing we do? Because we're trained as police officers. We have to have our hair cut short. We have to be clean. You know, everything has to be just a certain way. The minute they give you a gold shield and they put you in narcotics, you put the earrings back in, you grow a goatee, and then you're a badass, right? You can do anything. You can conquer the world. Um, so I had that little bit of, of a rebel in me. I grew my hair out. I grew my beard long. Uh, and I, I took on the biker persona early in my career. And uh, because I used that when I infiltrated the decaps later on in, in my career. So I would say for a good 10 years, I infiltrated a lot of outlaws, white supremacists. So I had that biker persona. And like I said, I got myself into a situation one time and I almost got myself uh, armed or killed by some gang members on a dope deal. And uh, it went horribly wrong. So I, by then I was in my first marriage and I had some young kids. And, uh, you know, I was trying to create a family, but I realized real fast I'm going to get myself killed. So I shaved, cut my hair, took my earrings out, went back to work. And then I realized it's not, it's not the look I needed, you know, because sleeping on the ground and riding a bike is fun. Being an outlaw biker is fun. But you sleep in a Super 8, you sleep in a double wide trailer with bug infested mattresses, you know, you're not living a good life. And then I realized I could live a better life as a clean cut businessman, uh, kind of like an OC guy. I never portrayed myself to be an OC guy. The accent goes a long way. My gestures and my hand movements, everybody just assumes around the country you're connected. You have a New York accent, maybe, you know, same thing in Detroit, right? You have that Detroit accent. And no matter how you turn it on and off, if I need to turn it all the way up, I could turn it all the way up and become a real Galvone, as they say, right? Um, in Detroit, yeah. it's more of like an attitude than an accent. It's more it is, like right? we hustle harder here. <laughs> like you It's do. very entrepreneurial. Yeah, well, you know, listen, you got to hustle. I'm, just, I'm talking about on the streets. I mean, obviously, Henry Ford and Motown, you can talk about it from a corporate. But on the streets, it, it kind of mirrors that. It's just, you know, everyone's a hustler. Everyone's uh, on their grind 24-7. 24-7. Detroit yeah. is one badass city. It yeah. produces some badass individuals. It really does. Um, and again, having worked around the country, some of the best work I did was out there. You know, or I associated myself with some other covers from there. I learned a great deal from them, you know. So you just took these different things. You would go around and cherry pick. You know, if I had to get something from the West Coast, if I was dealing with the cartels, if I had to go down south to Miami or someplace, I maybe stay in New York. It depends where, where you're moving and shaking. So um, and again, you had that New York stink on you. So people just assume that you were a connected guy, at least a connected guy. 
So uh, early in my career with the FBI, they would use me for bona fides. Guys like me, because they brought you in, maybe you had to sprinkle a little bit of organized crime or just give them the impression that we were organized crime guys without saying it. So a lot of that we did. Um, but then I, it, the De Cavalcante case wasn't my first time infiltrating the mob. I had some other cases. Uh, I did some, maybe two or three other cases beforehand. I did one with the Andragadas over in Italy. Um, so I did some of that. So I had some exposure. So I had that international connection as well and understanding. Then when it came time for the decavs, um, that was a crazy thing. We kind of just stepped in it. We didn't plan to infiltrate the mafia. It wasn't as much as we would love to say and take credit for it that we had this great operational plan. We didn't. It was a simple drug deal. It was a narcotics deal I showed up for in Atlantic City. And it kind of just took a, like I just described here. I showed up in my persona, a couple of guys, some low hanging fruit. They just latched on to me, some low associates in the family. And from that point on, it just kind of grew and grew and grew. When everybody sees some low, you know, some, I guess some, I don't want to say they're, they're like scum of the earth or anything, like street guys. Street guys are like, they're nickel and dime guys. They don't have two nickels to rub together. Like you said, they're hustlers, right? They're really hustling in the street. They're shooters. Um, they have they're some spoke, gang. Spokes on, a, spokes on a wheel. What's that? They're like spokes on a wheel, guys. Like from yeah. Donnie Brasco, where the Al Pacino character is taking a hammer to a, a parking yeah, meter. Parking like that's meter. how they're making yeah. their money. Exactly. These guys will make their money any way they can. Ripping people, you know, doing a coke deal and then selling bullshit, selling some cut or something like that to them. So they were just, they were street guys. And when they showed up, um, you can only imagine when they went back and they started telling the story about the guy Giovanni and his family, his associates they met. You know, now all of a sudden these guys are making money. I was selling, and at the time, I was selling some counterfeit goods in the street. So I started trading out for dope as well. So I didn't have to spend the government's money um, like street guys do, right? We trade, we barter. So um, you can only imagine that the union sites and all these things that the mob controls and the decals had a great uh, control of. When this guy starts showing up with all these boots and Uggs and Fendi and, you know, Louis Vuitton bags and all kinds of stuff, we were hustling in the street. On top of it, I had cigarettes, too. So guys wanted to know where you're getting this stuff. Now, you know, one of the main guys, one, he was a, an associate at the time. He was a main guy later. Luigi Oliveri, he came knocking. He wanted to know. You know, so he asked this low-hanging fruit kid, Jimmy, you know, where you getting all this stuff? I guess he basically told him. Luigi asks to meet me. And then it's just kind of one step over to another, over to another. So when Jimmy, the guy I met first, and Louis started competing for my business, Louis was always good with his time and his money, right? In the street, everything is time and money. You got to be on time and you got to have your money right. You can't be jerking people around. Louis was great that way. Um, Jimmy, not so much. So, of course, the government wants to go one step higher and go after the bigger fish. So they go after Louis. And uh, I did work with him for a while. Jimmy wanted to win me back. His uncle was a recently released soldier in the Decavacante crime family. His name is Charlie Stango. A uh, long-standing organized crime guy. We're very familiar with him in the Bureau at the time. Um, he was into many cases. We've done him a few times. He had just recently been released for murder. He did, I think, a 15-year bid for murder. Uh, actually, he went on a run for a year when he killed a guy. And then he tried to kill his, uh, his co-defendant co in the case because he flipped on him and tried to put a contract on him as well while he was in hiding. So he's a badass. Charlie Stango is a badass. He's a mobster's mobster. He's the definition of it. And he's the kind of guy at the time he was in his, I guess, seventies, early seventies when I met him. And, uh, Jimmy figured he can trump Luigi by introducing Charlie Stango to me. So you can only imagine this guy was recently just released out of prison. So when he got out, he was taken care of by the family. We had some intelligence coming in that way. We knew he had gone and he was proposed to be a captain. So he was going to be bumped up to from a soldier to a captain. Uh, he's very tight with the administration, with the boss and the underbosses. He had familiarity with all five families. This guy was feared, respected, and still is to this day. Has connections to you know the motherland, has connections up in Canada, has connections everywhere. And uh, you know in the in the organized crime underworld, he's a feared man and a respected man. I came to learn that later. So as I met him, it was game on. It took me a while to infiltrate him, but as we did, uh, the case lasted a few years, several years. And then by the time the case was ended, I was Charlie's number one. Uh, you know, it wasn't easy to get that way, but we got there. Can, can we give, can we just back up for a second and, and kind of uh, 
go, um, you know, I guess we were at the 30,000 foot view and kind of drill down a little bit more um, granular. So would I, is it right when I say that mm-hmm. Luigi Oliveri, uh, I think some people call him Louis the dog, he was the kind of legendary, not kind of, the legendary Di Cavalcante boss, John Riggi, uh, Riggies, that was like his, one of his protégés, right? He was, yeah. So John Riggi, John the Eagle, they call him the Eagle yeah. Riggi. Yeah. Um, John Riggi was a long-standing boss for the organized crime, uh, Di Cavalcante family. You had Sam the Plumber, Sam the Cavalcante. Yeah, he was the, uh, the So John Riggi goes back many, many years under him. Uh, John Riggi was in, when I was infiltrating him, he was in his 90s. And it is important for you to understand who John Riggi was. Yeah. John Riggi was in New Jersey. The De Cavacantes are like the stepchildren of organized crime. They relate, some some organized crime families relate, uh, call them the farmers because yeah, a lot of sure. things were farmed out to them, right? When they, I think also, wasn't it also because of like in their mind, anything that wasn't New York City was farmland? Yeah, it was all farmland. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Right. They had a bunch of different you know reasons and, and people referred to them derogatory ways, but they were crazy, right? They were just a hair trigger. I think that's what it was, is out of the five families, like the decaps never could be because although they were probably the longest standing organized crime families in the American history, mm-hmm. I think they're one of the first. Yeah, started in, El- started in Elizabeth, I think. Elizabeth, New Jersey is where they are. Well, they're basically out of New, New York. York. New York and Elizabeth, yeah. yeah. And then you have a New York uh, faction of it also. But they never could catch on because they were so like, Old West gangbusters, they didn't give a shit. You know, whatever they wanted, they just went and got it. And I'll give you an example. I think uh, a couple of them in you know, one crew decided they were going to rob a place up in the World Trade Center. And they took the elevator all the way up, ski masks. They did this robbery, armed robbery. And it was great, you know, but they just couldn't get the street at them. They couldn't organize themselves to be organized crime. By the time these guys come down the elevator on, the, on you know, there's cameras in the elevator. They get all the way to the ground level with the ski masks on, and right before they get off the elevator, they take the they take the masks <laughs> off. You know, it was things like that. They, you know, they didn't give a shit. They were just crazy guys. Um, the stories of them, the legendary stories, like the things you would see back in the day. They would shoot each other in the street in front of just the civilians in their neighborhood. Peter's Town, where they're based out of in Elizabeth, New Jersey, was a very close knit Italian community. You know, very very close. You couldn't penetrate that, man. You know with the military uh they were that close and that well sought after and looked after uh, by the community the little old ladies man they were your eyes and ears sort of family back in the day so these guys uh, under john riggy's rule john riggy controlled a lot of the unions a lot of construction in new york and new jersey he oversaw a lot of the cement businesses and the local unions so because of that the other families had to work with him, the Gambinos and the, the Genovese, mostly worked with the uh, the decals for the contracts. Was there everything, any, sorry, uh, finish, finish. No, everything went through that, you know, John Riggi controlled all that. He did a great job of controlling the unions and the, uh, the labor unions. But was, was there an issue between Stango and Oliveri? There, later on there was, yeah. So there was some, so Luigi Oliveri, I knew of Luigi, you know, you got to remember, I was a case agent for years and years in organized crime. So I had a very, I had a very good understanding as an investigator who, who they were. I understood the, the structure of it. For years, I would go and do surveillances on Riggy, do surveillances in the neighborhoods. I'd go to all the funerals like a good, you know, FBI task force would do or intelligence task force, state police, whoever we were working with. So I knew the characters. You know, every, even everybody we infiltrated and I wound up coming, becoming friends with, I knew these guys. Charlie Stangle, not so much because he was out of the picture. He was doing his bid in prison. But the other people, I was well aware. Sitting in a van, sitting in surveillance, taking pictures, watching their mannerisms over the years. Um, and they had a spillover into Bayonne. You know, the, the area I grew up, there was some decaps in Bayonne, some capos that lived there. I grew up around some of the capos. Uh, they controlled some businesses there. They came there to go to dinner. They were coming to my neighborhood. And so I was familiar with them that way, too. Um, so the decavs, uh, Luigi was a, a, a known associate. Born and raised in Peterstown. He committed to that life at a very young age. When John Riggi was in prison, there was an acting boss. And that acting boss, the driver for the acting boss was Luigi Oliveri. So who, who, intelligent who, boy. Which, which acting boss are we talking about? Uh, no, you, it wasn't, um, 
Louis was acting boss for for uh oh was it um uh, uh Frankie um Frank Arachi. Frank, Frank Garacci was the yeah. boss for a little bit. All right. And Lu- Louis Oliveri was driving for Garacci. Yeah. So Luigi Oliveri would drive Frankie Garacci around. <laughs> and we had that intelligence. We knew that. Um, so I guess he aspired to be a higher level associate and maybe one day a made guy. So uh, he committed to a life of crime and a life of organized crime, I guess, at a young age. So he knew Charlie. They grew up in the same neighborhood. Um, I found out that much later when I was in the case. But you can only imagine as Luigi aspired to move up, uh, he just did everything he could. You know, the thing with Luigi was John Riggi's son, Manny Riggi, was a capo in the family eventually. And Luigi, it's important to understand, Luigi answered to Manny Riggi. And that's who he, that's who his captain was. So uh, that was it, you know, and that came to be a problem later. We can discuss later on when, when things went south in the family when I was infiltrating them. But that's pretty much the makeup of it. Um, like I said, Charlie Stanger was Charlie was a very uh, a, a very close friend to Tino Fumara. So Tino Fumara is the Genovese Genovese cop, or was a Genovese cop? Of course, much later. Tino Fumara was very tight with Charlie. We had a lot of intelligence on the two of them working closely together with a couple of homicides we were looking to solve. Homicides that were unsolved, unsolved homicide, um, unsolved homicides, and we were also looking for the bodies as uh, the FBI test was. So there was some information to be gleaned from this case. We never thought we'd infiltrate them the way we did and the way I did, but it was just a, a perfect, uh, the stars aligned for the Bureau and for me at the time in my undercover career, but it, it, it proved detrimental later in my career. To, it ended my career. So St- Stangle was dealing with Tino from the Genovese. He was also dealing with uh, Nikki uh, from the Gambinos, right? Nikki uh, Mita Rotunda. Nikki Mita Rotunda. Yeah. Yeah, Nikki Mita was the Jersey boss of the Gambinos. Yeah. And Charlie was interacting with him, right? Yeah, Charlie was interacting with him. When I came into the picture with Charlie, yeah, they were very close. I I knew who he was, um, introduced and and understood that it was his Mubata, and they were very close. And, you know, Charlie leaned on him a lot and vice versa. So so jump to when you're undercover and and things uh, start to go uh, south, like you said. Yeah, so things were great. I met Charlie. Jimmy, like I said, Jimmy was Charlie's nephew. He tried to trump Luigi. So he says to me one day when I was meeting him in a, in a mall and having lunch, he goes, you know, my uncle's a captain, you know, soon to be captain. He's a soldier. He's going to be made a captain. So, again, I didn't come into this saying that I had a master's degree in organized crime. I played stupid. And when I played stupid, like a guy like Jimmy, Jimmy, it's important to know, Jimmy beat me for some drugs one time. He gave me some cocaine, and it was all cut. Cut is what you mix coke with. If you have pure cocaine, you mix it with an agent, a cutting agent to make more. It was all cut. There was no controlled dangerous substance in it whatsoever in the bag he gave me. Complete screw up. What he did was he took a shot at me, and that's known in the street, okay? So a street kid like that, he doesn't have the common sense. Whether he had to pay a cable bill, a car payment, whatever it is, sometimes that's just the way it is in the street. You know, it's look, I got a, I got a two hundred, three hundred dollar bill. I got to take a shot of Scott. You know, I like him, but I got to make my money. I got the UFC fight is on this weekend. I can't. I don't have my pay per view. I got to pay my bill. Something as simple as that in, in the underworld can, can get you ripped off. So when he gave me this product, I sent it to the lab, and the FBI sends it out. They get it tested, and they tell me, listen. It's, it's no good. It's all cut. It's garbage. Um, so you can only imagine at that point, I got to do one of two things. I either got to cut it off and end it, and then he gets arrested with whatever we have, or I could challenge him if the bureau would let me. I had a boss at the time who had a real set of, of uh, he's had a set of balls on him because he said to me, look, what do you want to do? I said, I want to throw it back in his face. Not literally, but I want to give it right. back. I want to ch- I want to challenge him. So that boss, he turns around. He says, you know what? Go get me one more lab. Get me a lab test. If it proves negative again for CDS, controlled dangerous substance, I'll let you put it back in the street. Because again, liability is everything to the government. We don't want to put anything in the street that's going to harm somebody. So uh, <laughs> I got the lab. It comes back negative, And I called Jimmy up. And basically the narrative was, are you out of your fucking mind? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? And he goes, what? What's the matter, G? That stuff you gave me last night, it was garbage. You know, it's what you, you, you got to be an idiot. Well, what are you talking about? So I explained to him, listen to me. 
This isn't for me. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm middling this for somebody. The guys I brought it to, and I insinuated that they were outlaw right. bikers. Right. That's how I introduced my 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 legend. And I said, look, these guys are family to me, and I've known these guys a long time. This is the circles I used to run them. They're not going to hurt me. They know I would never rip them off. But they call me, and they want to know where you live. Right? That set the dynamic. So all of a sudden, Jimmy says to me, okay, listen, flush it, get rid of it. No, no, no. For evidence purposes, I want to give it back to you. So what happens is he says, look, bring it to this club. There's a social club called the Ribera Club. That's the stronghold for the yeah. County. They all belong there. Every they single all- member belongs to <laughs> the Ribera Club. They do. So you can only imagine, here's my intelligence. My law enforcement brain goes, he wants me to bring this to the Ribera Club. If I get caught dropping drugs off outside the Ribera Club and I'm not a member of that family or that Borgata, I'm done. You know, they'll, they'll do me right there. So I rolled the dice and we did. We dropped it off to him and he gave it back to him for evidence purposes. And when I did that, my bona fides kind of went up a little bit. So he says to me, listen, man, let's keep doing business together. I'll introduce you to my uncle. You know, I'll try to get a meeting. Charlie is not going to have that. There's no way Charlie was going to meet me. Cold out of prison. He's on parole for a couple of months. There's no way he's going to meet some guy that, like me. What he did do, he asked the Gambinos to vet me. And when he asked the Gambino crime family to vet me, he says, look, meet this kid. He's with my nephew. See what my nephew's into. And he would say, you know, he, he talked very derogatory about his nephew. You know, see what that idiot's doing. You know, he can't rub two nickels together. The kid, though, he's a moron. See what he's into. So I met these guys and they vetted me out and I answered all their questions and they must have went back. And we assume that they told Charlie good things because Charlie says, OK, I'll meet this guy. So we had a meeting with the Gambinos, the Di Cavacante at the time, soldier, Charlie Stango and the nephew. And then he says, look, I'm, I'm on parole. I'm moving out to Nevada. I'm moving from Florida. We're in New Jersey. This guy's out only a couple of months. He's already breaking parole to come to New Jersey on vacation. And he gets his parole. I don't know how he did it, but he got his parole moved to Nevada, you know, right outside of Vegas. So he says to me, you know, nice meeting you. Um, didn't ask any business. He didn't want to know nothing. He just, you know, he just explained in, to his nephew in front of me. He says, look, whatever you're doing in the street, I'm going to let you do it. But I'm going to let these guys watch over, meaning the Gambinos. He says, you do business with them. Remember, you represent me. I'm your uncle. Don't embarrass me. And if you fuck this up. I'm going to let these guys have you. You guys in a restaurant? Where were you guys? We were in a diner, Union Plaza Diner in uh, Union, New Jersey. So that was it. It was about an hour long meeting. Uh, he met me, said, nice to meet you. And that was it. He, he, he got on a plane and I assume he, he moved to Henderson, Nevada. And then months went by. And then Jimmy says, yeah, my uncle's happy about what we're doing. He's getting feedback. And, you know, everything's going good with Danny Gooms, the guy from the Gambinos and all these other guys that were selling stuff to we started giving some stuff to some Lucchese guys. And uh, next thing you know, you're working outside of different Borgatas now. So Charlie, once he sees that, he goes, okay. So he says, tell the kid Giovanni, call me on my phone. He can call me. And that was it. He just friendly conversations for a few weeks, maybe a month or so. And we built up and built a relationship. Like a couple of teenage girls talking on the phone every night, you know, just blah, blah, blah. You know, How's the weather? What are you doing? Where are you from? He was kind of vetting me out himself. And everything was going great. You know, and I'd say about maybe six months or so went by and, you know, he wasn't asking for money. He wasn't asking for anything like that. He wasn't sticking his hands in our pockets because he's very cautious. He's on parole uh, on paper, as we say in the street. So uh, everything was going great. And then uh, he tells me, you know what, Um, go and get another burner phone and then call me on that phone and call me on this number. He's got a burner phone now. We don't really talk criminal stuff. He's just you know saying, look, you know, this is who I am. You know, my nephew told you who I am. He told you what I listen. I'm letting you do what you do in the street. I'm allowing it. He's not asking for any kick up at that point. So a couple of conversations went by and then he left me some crazy voicemail. And then you can only imagine in the middle of the night, I get a voicemail on my burner. I pick it up. I think it was three o'clock my time. <laughs> I was on the East Coast. Charlie's on the West Coast. So it's midnight his time. And he just cra- left his crazy voicemail. Whatever you and my nephew are doing, I want nothing to do with it. You know, do yourself a favor. Don't set my nephew up, you know, and do yourself a favor. Don't ever call me back. I don't want nothing to do with you. And that was it. Click, hung up. So that was like, okay, I don't know what the hell sparked that. Fast forward, we found out it was that he had a nightmare. 
So he had an episode when he was sleeping one night and he had a, a nightmare about me and somebody else. And I guess he just had a bad feeling about me. So his wife was always whispering in his ear, you know, don't trust anybody you don't know, that kind of thing. She's always, she always looked out for him. So uh, he had that episode and then we left it alone. You know, we just, I, I didn't do any business with Charlie for a, a few weeks, maybe a month or two. Kept making money in the street with the other families, making money with Luigi. I started doing more business with Louie because Louie the dog, they called Louie the dog for a couple of different reasons. He owned a pet store at one time in Elizabeth and he had some pit bulls. So Louie the pet, Louie the dog, that was his street name. So, uh, so Louie the dog, he, like I said, he's always good with his money. So I had no problems with him. So I started doing more and more business with him, kind of getting away from Jimmy. Charlie must have been watching from afar and realized, oh, nobody's getting pinched. So, you know, greed is greed, right? So he starts calling me up on my burner phone. I'm down in Quantico teaching a class, and he starts blowing up my phone. Call me back, call me back. Hey, it's Charlie, give me a call. And you could see what a crazy man he was, because the more voicemails I made him lead, the angrier he was getting. And then he would start cursing at the poor lady that was the voicemail message, you know, at the, at the tone, leave a beep. When she would say, at the tone, he'd start screaming at her, calling her four-letter words and all kinds. And the voicemails are just classic because you could see him spiraling out of control. And he thinks the lady, he thinks the computer voice yeah. is an actual he's person. so institutionalized. And, you know, it's just, <laughs> you know, for the sake of your viewers, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but you can only imagine the vulgar. The, the, and we would laugh and giggle on like little kids. Listen to this voicemail. And, it went Quantico. So the Bureau said to me, no, he's a stone cold killer. We don't know how many bodies he has on him. We know he's done murder. We know he's capable of it. We can't let you go to Vegas. We don't know what he's capable of doing to you if you go to Vegas and meet him or Henderson, Nevada, and meet him. So they wouldn't let me go. So there was an internal battle within the Bureau. And some guys said, look, let's try to mitigate this. Me, I was the biggest cheerleader for man. Let me go. Because my addiction to adrenaline, anything that caused me harm or or put me in harm's way is a lot of undercovers would say you. That's that's the drive. That's what we do. We do it for the thrill. You know, it's like riding a roller coaster for us. Um, we don't do it for accolades and extra money. We don't get medals. We don't get extra pay for doing this kind of work. It's the addiction to it. That's really why we do it. So me, you can only imagine. I'm like, mm, not a good idea. I got a wife and kids. You know, by this time I had another. I, start, I was divorced. I got married. I started another family, and you know, now I have two younger kids and. I was like, man, I really shouldn't be doing this, you know? But my wife is law enforcement also. She warns me at this time, like, listen, this is a slippery slope. Let's not do this, you know? She did undercover work as well. All the signs were on the wall, and I just didn't want to see any of them. So, again, it was my addiction and my, my, my thrill-seeking attitude that I was like, no, nah, man, I got to get out to Vegas. Let me go see what he wants. Because he said to me, listen, you know, come out to Vegas. Finally, when I did answer the phone after all of the voicemails, I made, I, work, I made him work for it a little bit. And finally, he says, look, I'm out to Vegas. You know, the, the Kentucky Derby's running at the time. And I think that, uh, what was that, American Pharaoh or something like that. I don't forget what the horse was running. It was a big thing at the Kentucky Derby. So I said, oh, you know what, maybe I'm, I'm going to come out and put some bets on this horse. Maybe I'll come out. So I did. And we, I sat down with him. He came and met me at, at, a, at a, uh, an asset we had at the, in, in Vegas on a strip. and. Um, he didn't talk to me. You know, it was very, very standoffish, you know, very talk about the weather, talk about my life, talk about the travel. He wouldn't talk about anything criminal. And I'm scratching my head going, you asked me to come out here. Like, what do you want? Like, what do you, when are we going to get to the meat and potatoes here? And uh, thinking that the whole day, you know, I had a little cabana. I spent government money. I rented this cabana, five grand for the day to get this thing and watch this Kentucky Derby and ordering all this food. And, and then going, you know what? This is going to be a bust. This guy's jerking my chain. So finally, it was so scalding hot. You know, you can only imagine with the different building. Out in Vegas, it's like you don't have one sun. You got like five or six suns bouncing off the, the sides of the buildings and I'm roasting. So we're sweating. I'm soaking wet. And I'm like, listen, I, I got to go take a dip in the pool. I realized, you know, let me strip down. I went in the pool. As soon as I went in the pool and he saw me submerge myself up to my chin and do a lap, he says, get out of the fuck. Come out of the pool. Come out. He wanted to make sure I wasn't wearing a wire. I wasn't wearing a wire, right? You know, smart. So he says, you know, that was it. When I got out of the pool, he wouldn't even let me go get a towel. He wouldn't even let me dry off. He made me sit right next to him, you know, rubbing up our bodies on each other and sweat all over. And he's like, all right, listen, this is why I asked you to come. And he opened up like a book. And he just said, this is who I am. 
This is who I'm with. This is if you want part of this. And I play stupid. I was like, yeah, I know a little bit about it, but I don't know enough to be part of it. You know, like, I'll teach you. I'll, I'll teach you along the way. So I said, yeah, you know, look, I heard you were something. I don't I don't even know what the, the pattern is and the, the hierarchy. I don't know how you guys are kind of similar to, I, I got a biker lifestyle. Like, I don't know what you guys do. And he said to me, no, same thing. The street's the street. And he did. He gave me little nuggets. He's such a, he's, and he's an intuitive guy. He really would make a great professor in a college somewhere teaching, you know, a, a, the, the subject matter expert on organized crime. LCN 101. Oh, man, just to write a book, like the little things he gave me and the isms and, and things he said to me. He would, he would say something, and it was so profound and so deep, you know, that he was just so street smart. Money-wise, numbers, he, was, he, had a, he does have a brilliant mind. But he's got this crazy Charlie the Hat is his nickname. You know, he's, he turns like uh, he'll turn on you on a dime, you know, he'll just kill you. And later on, I come to find he even said to me, you know, listen, I kill more people by accident. You, you know, when somebody says that to you and, and you got other organized crime guys saying, what are you doing with this guy? Like, he's, he's, a, he's a handful. Like, he, he's going to get you into some trouble. So. When my relationship with Charlie started to grow, Luigi got jealous. So you can only imagine, Louis was making pretty good money with me, right? And, and vice versa. So when the Bureau decides, start focusing on Charlie. But you have Jimmy on a back burner over here. Now put Louis on a back burner over here. You know, as, a, as an undercover, this can look really bad because you you got all these moving parts and all these, like you said, cogs in the wheel, you know, all these spokes. And you can't just jump around all the time. That makes you look stupid and it makes you look suspect. But they said, look, run with Charlie. We'll open up a case and it'll be an organized crime case, a Lacosta Nostra case. And we did. And the Bureau, they got all happy and giddy because now I was infiltrating Charlie. Charlie had gotten made just as I met him. He got made a capo. And we knew that because within the family, we knew the night he was getting made through intelligence purposes. And they actually followed him to his meeting and watched him get made at his location. Wait, who, who bumped him? Riggy, bu- Riggy bumped him? Um, Riggy was the boss at the time. Yeah, Riggy was Riggy was the boss at the time. So it was Riggy that gave him the bump. Um, Charlie Mugera, Charlie Big Ears Mugera, he was um, he was an upper comer in the family, and so was Joe Milk Merlo. Those two guys, their fathers and uncles, were at the Appalachian meetings way back. That's how far back they go in their life. Charlie Mugera. He was, he had aspirations to be the next boss. John Riggy was in his 90s. He was going to start stepping down and pass the torch, as they say. And there was going to be a new administration coming in, new bosses. At the time, Joe Merlo, he was the underboss of the family. Um, and they were making that transition. John Riggy was pretty much homebound at that time. Manny Riggy was spending some time with him at home with his pop. But the thing was, Louie was going every day, hanging out with the old man. Watching Wheel of Fortune, I assume, buying him some bagels, doing whatever you do with a 97-year-old guy. Very smart, right? Aligning himself. And it's like Reggie, always- Louie, and Pat Sajak and Vanna White. Yeah, yeah. Right. You can see it. You know, you can see them all solving right. puzzles and you know. Yeah, right. You know. <laughs> but again, it's a simple life. You know, not everything is smashing meat, you know, parking meat is in the social club. It's not always like that, you know. Sometimes it is just sitting in people's houses and, and just spending time. You know, I had a lot of that too. So it wasn't all murder, mayhem, and, and committing crimes. A lot of it was a lot of downtime. And that's later on, in, a year into it, here I find myself on Charlie's couch watching TV with him. Again, you know, we really truly became a relationship of a father and son as time went by. And it happened very quickly. He either saw something in me or he saw, he, he saw some kind of a, an advent, I was advantageous to him. You know, either he really believed in what I could do for him or he saw that hey, I'm going to use this kid as a springboard to go make me some money, put some money in my pocket, and then I'm going to get my status back and build my empire. You know, so you had all these different people. They were all line, aligning themselves for this new regime. Nobody knew what the regime was going to be yet. So when the old man Riggy was going to pass the torch, who knew where the family was going to go? I knew all those intimate details because as time went by and Charlie built relationships with me. And he built trust with me. He would share those things with me. And as time went by, you can only imagine, for evidence purposes, I would question. But how does this work? He would say to me, look, I'm with the decavacantes. 
he came up with these tapes, are, they're, they're phenomenal tapes for intelligence purposes. And he would say, and you got to play stupid, but you can't play too stupid because you start asking too many questions, you look like a rat. You don't look right. like a cop, you look like a rat. So I would say to him, so how does that work? Like, who's this guy? Who's a, what would you call it? A concierge? No, a concierge. A concierge. A concierge. A concierge. You don't you fucking listen, Giovanni. Listen to what I'm saying to you. It's not a concierge. I said, I don't know. What, what, what does he do? And I would play stupid. And he explained it to me. So the intelligence was tremendous coming in. Then he would say to me, my, my Gumbara and this poor guy, my friend in this family, the five families, he would start explaining to me, this is how it works. This is what I have. Like those things you have, Giovanni. You have all those boots. You have the shoes, the cigarettes. I will let, I'll let you sell them to other Borgatas. We can make a lot of money. Okay. Again, never asking for any money from me. Never sticking his hands in my pocket. Just as a good friend, right? So uh, as time went by and he realized and he watched me move and he watched me operate, um, he watched me deal with Luigi and he heard Luigi question me. Luigi got jealous. <laughs> Luigi would say to me, he kept calling me um, and asking me for cigarettes. So I had really good cigarettes. I had uh, Marlboro Lights. I had Marlboro Reds. I had, I didn't have Newports. Once in a while, Newports. There's Newports in the street. They're pure gold. Anything menthol cigarettes, is pure yeah. gold. Street. So I was always smart not to have it. Once in a while, I would have a case here or there and make it look good. Um, but Luigi was buying a lot of my cigarettes. So he was making good money. Um, so I had dropped off some stuff to his social club. Not the Ribera Club. There was another social club that Louis had. And I dropped it off to him because he was with another crew. He, he was on the Manny Riggies crew. And as I dropped it off to him, I had an associate come with me to help me unload the boxes. I go inside. He says, hey, you took a long ride here. You want, you want an espresso? Come in and sit down. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I'm sitting down. He's making me espresso. And he says to me, uh, hey, I forgot to tell you. Um, we're being looked at. What do you mean? He says, well, I'm just letting, letting you know, you know. We know the bulls are looking at us. We got leaks. There's leaks in law enforcement, and we're getting information that they're looking at us. They're investigating. We don't know how, but there's leaks. And then he proceeds to say, and, you know, you're new. And there was just dead silence. What do you mean, I'm new? Like, I'm just saying, you're new. We're being looked at. And it's almost like he's trying to muster up the balls to say, you know, but he couldn't get it out. And I asked him, I said, you want to say something to me? You want to ask me something? Why don't you go ahead and ask me? Because I don't, I don't, I'm not comfortable with what you're saying. I had a criminal history. I was, I had been arrested. I had a, a CCH, a criminal history. I had been arrested for attempted murder. I had done time in prison. So if there was a law enforcement leak and they looked me up, I was already, my legend matched. I did time in prison. I was able to speak to it. And I think he knew that I had a criminal history. I know Louis never been arrested. Louis never even got a summons, a, a traffic ticket in his life because he doesn't even have a license. So knowing that, that's the, the law enforcement brain. I could use that against him. So I turned it up and I said, this is there something you want to ask me because I'm really not comfortable with what you're saying. So why don't you go ahead and grow the balls and ask me what you want to ask me, but be real careful. Because it sounds like you want to accuse me of something. And then he says, no, 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 it's not that way. I said, because I'll just leave now and I'll just take my shit and go. And no, I'll go make money somewhere else. So he goes, no, 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 listen to me. I'm just making you aware if you come down here to the neighborhood, we're hot right now. So you might have heat on you if you leave here. I said, oh, okay. So you're looking out for me. Oh, I appreciate it. I'll, <laughs> I'll clean myself off when I leave. So again, this crime family, being in Peterstown and being a decab Acantes, they're so tight knit. It truly is like a soap opera. Whatever conversations you and I have, everybody else quickly knows what's going on. They know I have these boots. They know I will make your money. Charlie sees it. And then uh, when I start dealing with Charlie, Luigi gets a little jealous and he starts reaching out to me. Yeah, hey, where you been? I got to see you. Ah, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. So finally, he can't get a hold of me. I stopped taking his calls. He reaches out to an associate of mine that was with me a few times when I dropped stuff off to him. He says, hey, I'm trying to get a hold of Giovanni. Have you talked to him? He says, yeah, yeah, I'm with him, I'm with him tomorrow. What do you want? He goes, tell him I want to see him. He says, all right, I'll text you. You know, we'll text each other and I'll see if he wants to set up a meeting. So I said, all right, you know what? Tell, text him and tell him I'll see him tomorrow. I'll, I'll come by and have lunch with him at Linden, Linden, New Jersey. It's the uh, Italian joint. So my associate texts him, sets up the meeting. 
I go and I go there and I have the meeting and he starts poking me. He says, so where you been? Mm-hmm. I've been around. I'm making money. What are you doing? He goes, oh, I haven't seen you. Where you been? I said, don't ask me my business. I don't ask you yours. Kind of stand off just like a gangster would do. And he says, ah, you've been out in Vegas with Charlie Stengel. I have been out there with Charlie. I know you are. And? Well, you know, I thought you'd be with me. You know, we're, we're making some good money together. And I'm, I'm looking to move up. And you should be with me. Why would I be with you? Charlie's a captain. Charlie's a shot caller. Why the fuck would I be with you? You know, I'm kind of like, yeah, I was kind of confrontational. I was a little shitty with him. Um, not knowing what had happened once, he had gotten himself made. So I guess watching Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy for so many hours, you get community service. I guess you just, you know, he cashed in all his chips and intelligence has it that he went up to his manny, John Biggie's son, and says, hey, you know, I want to be a made guy before your father passed the torch. You think it could happen? Can he propose me for membership? So I guess Manny Riggy goes in and says, hey, pop, you know, this kid wants to be made. So I guess John Riggy just turns around and goes, oh, you want to be made? Bada bing, bada bing, you're made. All right? During a commercial, you're made. You know, and- <laughs> in, the, in between uh, Alex Trebek and uh, Pat yeah. Sajak, they made yeah, You want to be a made guy? Just <laughs> wait for this last puzzle. And then yeah. be- between commercials, I'll make you. And I, I'm being funny about that, but I don't mean to be disrespectful. But I can only assume we weren't in a room, but that's kind of how it happened. Um, that he just said, oh, you want to be a made guy? Well, I'm John Riggy. I'm the boss of this family. I, can do I run this family. You're a made guy. Yep. That's that. So that's you made. The rest of the administration, the rest of the family understands. In organized crime, that's not how it works. You know, you have to be proposed. Your name has to go on a list. Your name has to be brought around by a concierge. Uh, I almost said concierge. The consigliere, the consigliere takes the, the, the list to all the other uh, borgados, the other crime families. They vet you just as if you're getting promoted, like a, like a cop would get promoted. And then they say, no, we don't have any problems with Scott Bernstein. We're good. Okay, you can get made. You know, they didn't do that. They broke protocol. Nobody would recognize Luigi as a made guy. Big, big problem. Because as this, the family started to splinter, as the old man was passing the torch, Mujera was making his way to be the boss and some other factions and some other crews in the family didn't want that. They wanted somebody else. So it started to be a little bit of a dis, dis, uh, a dis, distaste in, in their mouths for each other in amongst the crews. Luigi was on one side, Charlie was on the other. So they really started going at each other, you know. Um, and what happened was Charlie claimed me, didn't sit well with Louis. And then actually, Charlie had to get on a plane one time and fly to New Jersey for a sit down. And he had to go. At that time, it was the new administration. The acting administration was Big Ears and Joey Milk Merlo. They were the boss and the underboss acting at the time as the old man passed the torch. And uh, Louis pitched a bitch and he said, You know, I want Giovanni. He should do it with me. And they had to go to a sit down hours and hours and hours. So while I was waiting for him, I didn't know he was at a sit down for me. He just said, I have to go to a meeting. I'm coming to New Jersey. I got called in by, I got called in. Right? The administration called me in. So as I'm sitting in this little restaurant, I'm uh, I'm with some made guys from the Lucchese's. I'm with some made guys from the Gambino. And I'm with Charlie's, Charlie's wife. And I realized she started getting upset because he was taking too long. And we actually thought like, you know, and then all these other guys like, relax, relax. You'll be fine. You know, and she kind of, I, I realized that she had a pretty good handle on what, what kind of life he was living. He didn't he share a lot of the intimate stuff with her as well. So I was cautious around her. And he came back and he sat down. And he says, yeah, you know, he had a tie on. He had a jacket and a tie, pulled the tie to the side. And he says, man, I just, you know, I feel like I ran a marathon. I'm exhausted. So what, what, what happened? What's the matter? And the other guys being made guys, they know what he just went through, but I didn't know. And he goes, uh, what do you mean? I just had a sit down for five, six hours. I said, really? What, what happened? He says, well, because of you, because of me. He says, yeah, you, you were the top of the discussion for all these hours. I had to fight. I had to go to war. I had to go to war. And this kid wanted you. Luigi wanted you. And so I said, what happened? Who am I with? And, you know, I challenged him. He goes, who do you think you're with? I'm Charlie Stank. I'm, I'm a right. fucking capo. You're with me. I always win. You're, I always win. I always get my way. You're with me. And that's that. So uh, from that point on, it was game on. Now it was a different game. He flew back to Nevada. Uh, and, and he was just overseeing me from a thousand miles away, just telling me what to do, where to go, who to meet, you know, really setting me up for different things. 
Uh, probably within a year's time, he started. His son came into the picture, Anthony. They call him Whitey. White, Whitey, Whitey, yeah. Whitey, because of the color of his hair. Now, he had like bleach, bleach hair and uh, natural, natural color blonde. And, um, you know, Charlie called me up one day, he asked me to get the kid a job. I was running, I was helping a guy in a business that he had put me into a construction business. So I got Anthony a job driving a dump truck. And then before you know it, Charlie calls me up after a few months and he says, look, uh, I'm going to put Anthony under you. I said, he says, I'm going to put him under you. So you're going to put your son under me? What do you mean under me? He says, well, you're, you're going to steer the ship. So he made me his acting soldier for right. lack of a term. So next thing you know, he started building a crew for me. And I started building a crew for him. And he says, yeah, this is what I want. So Anthony will be under you. You'll start doing things. You'll report that report to you, and then you'll you'll be communication between me. And uh, that was it. Before you know it, I'm flying back and forth to Vegas. I'm spending a lot of time out there. I have a place out there, a place in New York, and you know, um, it was it was crazy. By that time, in the case, it was just insanity. You know, everybody knew me as Charlie's kid. He explained to me every meeting I went to from now on. No matter what you do, no matter who you're doing business with, you take our flag, you stick the flag in the dirt. Let it be known you're with the decal of base, and that's it. Then you then you do your business. He says, I don't care who it is, you're with us now. And that's how it goes. So uh months went by, months and months, and I was doing a lot of drug deals and stuff like that. And then I started kicking up to him eventually. He started out with, Hey, send me a car payment, you know. Because he'd ask me, You're making good money, huh? You're making a lot of money. Yeah, I'm doing all right, you know. Like, yeah, yeah, you're doing all right. I set you up pretty good. Yeah, I'm doing all right. And he'd say to me, Well, you know what? You got it. Send me a little bit, you know, send me a car payment, a cell phone bill, whatever you got to help me out. You know, I'll give it to the old lady. She could pay some bills. Well, let me tell you something. The minute you miss a payment. No, I didn't get a payment. Where's my payment? You know, and then he, you know, again, evidence purposes. And that's part of our, our, our trade craft is we have to work towards that. So before you know it, I'm kicking up to him. And then before you know it, we're making scores. I'm doing drug deals. I'm doing all kinds of stuff in the street. We're selling some hijacked goods. Uh, and he knew everything I was doing. And then it got to the point where I started dealing with other crews, me and Whitey. Uh, Whitey had brought me around some other guys within the decaps, started doing some stuff with some other crews. So I was the one representing Charlie, paying the other capos. I would go to their house, pick up to them, give them their piece. You know, again, that's a ballsy move because when I said to him, hey, you know what, Uncle Joey, Joey was a May guy, a capo. I said, you know, you want me to, I got Joey's piece. You want me to bring him his, his cut, his share of this load? He goes, no, nah, let his guy bring it to him. Why would you bring it to him? Are we talking about Gia, John, Joe Giacobbe? No, uh, Joey, uh, Joe Coletta. Joey Coletta, okay. Coletta was one of, he was an old school guy. Yeah. yeah. He was, uh, at the time he was on, I think he was on either house arrest or parole for murder, you know, at home with his oxygen tank. And, you know, he just, uh, so I said to Charlie, <laughs> you want me to bring him his money? He's not. Let his guy worry about that. That's his crew brings it. Yeah. So again, you can only imagine this is the relationship. But yeah, but Charles, I don't want there to be any bumps in the road. I don't want anybody to accuse anybody of shorting somebody or anything. I got to go by that area anyway. So if you call Uncle Joey, just tell Uncle Joey I'm going to stop by. So you can only imagine by this time, Whitey and me referring to Charlie as daddy. You know, did you call daddy today? You know, he knows where his kids. He's telling people, hey, I'm sending my kid over, you know, or I'm sending my boys over. So that's the kind of relationship we had at the time. So I was flying out to Vegas a lot, paying my, my kick up to him. I was around him and his wife a lot. But, you know, we had all of our criminal stuff going and he had the, he was coaching me. But we also had some legit stuff, you know, legitimate job, legitimate contracts, legitimate businesses. You know, we were buying the Olympic Gardens Lounge in Vegas. It was the only place that had strip and gaming in it. And the OG, they call it. Oh, you guys own that? Yeah, we were buying it. We uh, the contract was done at the end of the case. I was going to manage it. Yeah, I had, I didn't. Okay, so I've been there before. I'm not trying to put my producer on blast or anything, but Benny was going to Vegas a couple a month ago, and I was like, "Yeah, the, I, I mean, is OG still around?" So OG was closed at the time, and and your producer was probably there strictly for uh, research purposes. So. Right. No, I just remember because the two strip clubs. I, I'm going on a way. Yeah. I'm going down a rabbit hole here. But the two strip clubs when I used to go to uh, bachelor parties back in the 2000s, I went to a ton. We would right. either we'd either end up at uh, Spearmint and Rhino or, yeah, Rhino, or OGs. Yeah. 
Yeah, the OG I, was famous. The OG yeah. was famous. Yeah. And again, it's famous because it had two floors. It had the gaming and strip, which is very rare in Vegas. And uh, yeah, so we actually did the, I guess it's a blessing, Scott, because if the case kept going and it didn't end the way it did, I was I was set. I was going to be the manager and, uh, you know, Charlie and I were going to run it and I was running for him and it was just, it was a done deal. I don't know if I would have survived that. I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't it as, as things were coming to a close, wasn't it? Uh, uh, Charlie Big Ears was ascending and uh, Charlie the Hat thought he was going to become an underboss and you were going to get your butt. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was all this stuff started happening, the divide in the family and the two, uh, two sides. Mujer was ultimately, he was going to win it, right? You know, he's got the history, he's got the knowledge, he's got the, the, the respect. Um, and Richie, just for everyone to know, Richie died in 2015 or 16. He, did, yeah. he was dead. He had passed away just as just as the case ended. I yeah. think right after I came out of that family, he, he had passed away. Um, yeah, I think just as I was coming out. And like so, you yeah. said, he was old. He was in his 90s. He was yeah, he was in his 90s. Yeah, yeah. He was gangster's gangster. Yeah. Pretty young. Um, but yeah, Charlie Mujer was moving up. I knew Charlie was, I knew Charlie Stengo was reporting back to him. I knew. So what happened was it got to the point where um, Charlie wanted to be known to the administration, to Mujera and Merlo and uh, the, the concierge, uh, concierge that I was his kid. So he wanted to make it official. That was something I never saw before. You know, it was like, hey, I'm coming in and I'm flying to Jersey and I'm going to go on a record with you. And I'm thinking on a record, on a record means you're going to make somebody, you're going to propose it for membership. That's traditionally what I knew it as. But I guess there's another kind of going on a record because he went on a record to make it known that I'm his kid. I'm his guy. I'm his associate. And I, you know, I'll be, I'll be the acting soldier for him or I'll be the go between. I'll be his voice because there was a whole pomp and circumstance that went with this. I didn't expect it. So he says, yeah, so I'm going to, I'm calling the end. Okay. He says, so dress shop, come here tomorrow. So you can only imagine it was like driving out to the set of the Sopranos because it was a neighborhood just like where Satrials is in the Sopranos. If anybody's familiar with the Sopranos and the little pork store, that's where we met, you know, and um, we roll up there. I was by myself and I roll up. And as I came around the corner, it was literally like driving out to the set of a production for the Sopranos. The bosses were there. Some May guys were there. Some local people were there. It was crowded. Cops with cops in uniform there, you know, from not not Elizabeth cops, but other agencies. Um, so when I walked in there, <laughs> Charlie introduced me, made a proper introduction, a formal introduction, and introduced me to the underboss and, you know, and served me up and said, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is, you know, from this point going forward. It wasn't a ceremony, but it was the strangest thing I've ever seen because I wasn't familiar with that part of organized crime, you know, and uh, and everybody knew. You know, and the funny thing was when I showed up and I walked in, I went to give Charlie two kisses and he stiff on me, you know, and he, he, he whispered to me, not here, not here. Because I guess there was some this business, this place was open for business. So there were civilians there too, in and out, you know, like low level associates. And he didn't want anybody knowing, you know, so I felt it was weird. But he, he checked the box later and explained to me why. He says, you know, you got to be cautious. People are always watching the bulls. The bulls are always watching. So he was always, he always reminded me of that. So after that, I went back, he went back to Vegas and then it was game on from that point forward. You know, now he shared everything, every intimate conversation he would have with me on a phone or in person telling me what was going on with the family. More importantly, how my relationship with Luigi and how Luigi's relationship with the family wasn't, it wasn't faring that well. There was a Christmas party and during that Christmas party, Louis had offended somebody a long time standing captain. And a, a very capable guy, which means, you know, a guy. Who, who was it? It was uh, Tinio Scalfani. Scalfani, okay. Yeah, yeah. Which is, he was an old school guy, you know, uh, very, uh, very mob-esque, like just out of a, a, a movie set, you know, of a, the Godfather. So he was sitting in a, in a Christmas party, and I guess it goes where Luigi walked in and had some very offensive language because they wouldn't acknowledge him as a made guy. And it really hurt him. And then he made his opinion known. That I'm going to come up the chain, and you're all going to reap the, you know, you're all going to rue the day that this happened. So uh, that didn't fare well. So 
And then uh, the administration decided Charlie had dinner with, I had dinner with Charlie out in Vegas. Mm-hmm. I kicked up to him. I had a, I paid him some money and he says, yeah, this thing with this the dog, you know, mm-hmm. it's not going good. And so what do you mean? And he goes, ah, it's not going to, he's not going to survive it. He's not going to survive it. What are you talking about? He says, yeah, they're going to they're clip him. And he's gone. He's going to be gone. So I said, well, why are they going to be gone? Well, he's doing this. He's doing this. He wants to be acknowledged. He's wearing a hat that don't fit his head. You know, he thinks, he says, you know, he thinks he's his own Don, that kind of thing. And he left it that way. So uh, I said, wow. So they're just going to kill this kid? You know, not kid. They're just going to kill this guy? What the fuck? Like, where's the loyalty, you know? He goes, well, it is what it is. And uh, I told him, you'll do it. <laughs> I said, what? Oh by, oh, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, what? He says, yeah, I, I figure, you know, you should do it. I, I should do what? Like, I should kill him? Like, how, that, I can't kill this guy. Like, they'll all come for me. And at that point, he used to even say to me, like, he got angry with me in the restaurant and says, look, be the man you were born to be. Be the man I've taught you to be. You know, you, why, you don't want to do this? So I made it known I could do it. I'm capable of it. I said, look, you don't know my history, but I, I, have, a, I have a history. I'm a capable guy. And he, he, he had actually admitted to me, I know, I know about the whole thing in Hawaii where I got arrested and for attempted murder and all kinds of stuff. He says, yeah, yeah. I said, all right, so what do you want me to do? You want me to use my crew? Use our guys? No, nah, no. Nah, 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 they're, they're too stupid. You can't use them. He said, you got to find somebody else. I said, well, what do you want me to use? I said, you know, you know my buddy Dutch. You know, I got those guys. They should, you know, that's what, and I kind of insinuated. I said, yeah, you know what, that Louis, because Louis had, it's a long story, Scott, but Louie and I had a falling out and shortly before this whole thing with him getting the, hit the contract on him. And uh, he threatened to chop me up into pieces and, and he tried to, he tried to pretty much take us out as a crew. Our crew started going to war with his crew. A lot of things were going back and forth. They were texting each other and, you know, we starting to get guns together and guys were going to go. I mean, they were going to battle. I mean, it was mm-hmm. a war. It was brutal. So uh, I was trying to keep all those fires, you know, from, from getting out of control. So. That's kind of why he gave me the contract, because he knew all those things were going on. He knew that Louie was making threats. He knew that Louie was threatening to kill our whole crew. His crew was texting people, you know, see you later on, we'll be, but, you know, we're going to swing by and see you guys later, that kind of stuff, like real fucking teenage stuff. So uh, he knew all that. That's why he gave it to me. So when I made that comment and I said, you know, you should meet my buddies, Dutch and the other guy, and they, they, that you know, Charlie, they, you should meet them in a dark alley, you know, scare the shit out of him. He goes, hey, you know what? You should use those guys. Would they help you? Yeah, they'll, they'll help me. Sure. I could ask them. You want me to ask them? And then that whole thing where it was a we plan to do the murder and kill, you know, at, originally it was we were going to kill two guys. So, and then they took one off the table thinking, you know what? It's not good for business. You know, let the dust settle. And uh, with the Manny, with Manny Riggy, um, with John Riggy passing the torch, it's not good to have a war in a family. So just, just kill Louie. So I, I plan to kill Louie for a number of months. And then finally the case came down, you know, that was, that was that. <laughs> you literally lived, you lived a movie script. I say this uh, to a lot of my guests, but some are, it's some it's more, more accurate than others. And it, it's, it's surreal, man. I, I, even hearing it from you for, I've heard it, I've heard this story kind of parts of the story uh, multiple times and I learn more each time. And uh you really, we, we, it's a tip of a hat to you, I mean, because the debt that, that, that you've, that this country and, and, and the Uncle Sam owes to you, uh, I'm sure it probably can never be repaid. Get that, getting that part of your life back, uh, it's, it's true sacrifice. Well, there was a lot of mistakes. I, I do appreciate it, Scott, and it's kind of it's humbling to hear you say that, but it was my job, right? It's, it's kind of what I found. It was my call. You know, my wife said to me, you can't keep doing this, but what? listen, I'm a good investigator. I'm good at what I do. I was always good. If you put me on a homicide, I was like a dog. I, I just never turned off, you know, not until I apprehended the guy. I didn't care where he ran to. If I investigated a burglary, if your house got broken into, you're victimized. I, I fought for the victims. I love investigations. And to this day, I do. But my true craft is, is covert operations. I love it. Right. And I can never get enough of it. But. I should have heeded a lot of warnings. Looking back, I was way too close. Louis questioned me one time when he did threaten to chop me up into pieces. And he said, you know, you walk like us, you talk like us, you know, you're, you're from, you're not from here, but you act like us. Like, where you been your whole life? Like, all these challenges came up. 
my daughter had a soccer game. I write about it in the book. And one of the game, you know, guys came walking up on me at a soccer game. I didn't have kids. I don't have undercover babies, you know. Um, the, the guy's rolling up on me. Jimmy, Jimmy Smalls, the kid that uh, was Charlie's nephew, he called me up one day. I write about it in a book that, you know, imagine me. I pick my little guy up from daycare and I'm cutting. I'm, I'm leaving Bayonne and I'm cutting through Staten Island. And I'm, I'm in my personal truck driving my kid in the, in the car seat in the back. And my phone rings. The kid's sleeping. I should have never answered the phone because, you know, God forbid the kid wakes up or something. He's got going, daddy. I answer the phone. And Jimmy says to me, hey, Kush. I mean, Kujin. Kush, where are you right now? So what do you want? Where are you right now? Where are you right now? Where are you? You driving? Are you in your truck? I had an Escalade. And I'm driving a black pickup. And I said, no, what do, you, what do you want? Why are you calling me? He goes, are you on a Gato's Bridge right now? And I was. I was in a black pickup. He goes, are you on a Gato's Bridge? No, what are you talking about? I'm down South Jersey. He goes, man, you're not in a black pickup truck on a Gato's Bridge right now? And I was bumper to bumper New York City traffic at 5 o'clock at night. And this, this, this bridge is only two lanes with no shoulder each way. So there's no way for me to get out of this. And I'm like, now I'm in complete panic mode. I got the baby seat in the back. He's sleeping. And I'm like trying not to look in the rear view and all these things. Like, I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not on a Gato's Bridge. I'm nowhere near you. If I was on a Gato's Bridge, I would have called you and had coffee with you. I'm nowhere near it. I swear to God, Cougine, I swear this guy looks just like, I'm going to catch up to him. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to catch up to this guy and get a picture of him. I'm going to send it to you. It looks just like. So now I got him trying to catch me. You know, and but by the grace of God. You know, I come down, to, I, I reach the peak of the bridge, mid-span, and I start coming down. And it opens up at the bottom of the bridge and all the toll plaza. <clears throat> and as soon as I opened up, man, I gunned it and I kind of screwed it through. And he's like, oh, I can't get a picture. I'm, I'm telling you, Cougine, this guy looked just like. There were moments like that through the whole case where the bells and whistles were there, the signs were there. But just like a true addict, you know, I, I didn't want to see the forest through the trees. I didn't care. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to hear no. You know, I was doing some of the best work in my career at the time. Um, then you got to remember, I was doing this case, but I was also infiltrating the triads. I was infiltrating the Black Panthers at the same time. I, this was, I wasn't just working one case. You know, yeah. I was in on a bunch of other cases. So, uh, yeah, juggling that lifestyle, it was crazy. It took its toll on my, me. It took its toll on my wife. You know, um, but, yeah, it, it took a beat on me. So uh, and ultimately it destroyed my, you know, it destroyed my career because I had to retire and, and, and go into relocation. The, that, that's what when I'm when I said, you know, the debt is kind of difficult to actually repay that type of debt. That's yeah. what I was saying. Like, you know, your your life is never the same. Nah. You've given a piece of yourself literally and figuratively uh, for the cause. Um, just I want to ask you two quick questions about the uh, people in the Decapicantes and then we will finish up with talking about uh, where they can consume uh, your content, the book. Uh, there's a new podcast or relatively new podcast that uh, Giovanni is the host of at the mom uh, at the mom museum um, that I want to tell people about. Uh, first, did you ever meet uh, an old school Jersey uh, guy, Polly Farina? No, I, don't, I never met him. Know the name. They called him Paulie Figs. The only reason I ask is because he died a couple of years ago. Uh, a bunch of the Detroit guys knew him. He was a union guy. Okay. Neither here nor there. Uh, last thing I'll ask is uh, a guy that was on your case that was indicted in that case uh, recently passed away, was a, a soldier in the DiCavacante crime family, uh, James Castaldo, a.k.a. Jimmy Dirt. Jimmy Dirt. Uh, can you just yeah. maybe uh, just give maybe two minutes on uh, <laughs> mem <laughs> memories of Jimmy Dirt? Yeah, Jimmy Dirt. Jimmy Dirt was uh, I didn't have any dealings with him. I knew of him, obviously, because of my investigative side of the house and, and doing, you know, um, over the years doing OC cases. And Jimmy Dirt, you know, you call him Jimmy Dirt because he had a, a company that he moved a lot of dirt. He had, uh, I guess, construction companies and dump mm -hmm. trucks. And he was known for potentially or, you know, allegedly moving contaminated dirt if you had it and he would get rid of it, that kind of thing. And it wasn't processed properly. He'd probably just bring it somewhere and dump it, that kind of uh, reputation over the years. And he was always looked at by law enforcement. 
Um, but Jimmy Dirt, he did come, he, he, he came, his name came up in the case when Charlie's wife, uh, I was out there having breakfast and she was looking out for me by the end of the case. And, and again, I was like family to her and, and vice versa. And she told me, just be really careful when you go home. You know, remember what I told you with the law enforcement leak, you know, it was a law enforcement leak and, and uh, we could never figure out where it was. And we didn't know whether the leak was, it, it was very, the movie The Departed, you know, that resonates. When I watched that movie The Departed, so many of that, so many topics in that movie was literally what I was living in that case. Because you can only imagine they came to me and they were like, yeah, listen, that thing Louis said about there being a leak is a leak. Okay. Well, you're the FBI. Where's the leak coming from? You know? That's like having a plumber show up at your house telling your pipes are leak and they don't know what to do. They, they don't know what to do, right. Yeah. You know? And 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 I went, okay, well, where's it coming from? Well, we're not sure. What do you mean not sure? Well, we're not sure whether it's local PD, state PD, a local agency, or uh, it could be within our own. We're thinking it, it might be here in-house. So the case was actually, it was red flag. So in the bureau, which means typically when you went on a computer, you can look up any intel you want. Yeah. But the case was sealed. And because we didn't know where the, the leak was, pretty big deal. And uh, they had meetings in a Hoover building about it and all kinds of crazy shit. So you can only imagine during the whole time. I can't think about that every day. You know, I got to just put it out of my brain and be like, you know what? If there's a leak, man, hopefully I find this dude or girl, whoever it is. And, you know, maybe they, they rear their ugly head and we can scoop them up in the case as well. Um, but hopefully they don't get me killed, you know, because it wouldn't be the first time I've been set up by cops or, or you know, had a leak in, in our cases. Um, so as it went on, his wife had said to me one day, as she served me coffee and breakfast, she says, listen, you're going home. When you get home on Monday, stay away from Jimmy Dirt. Jimmy Dirt? Who's Jimmy Dirt? And she said to me, just please, don't go near him. Stay away from him. He's getting arrested on Monday. What are you talking about? <laughs> you, you're always so paranoid. And she's like, uh, no, I'm telling you right now, don't go anywhere near Jimmy. He's being arrested. Don't talk to him. But I said, I don't even do business with this guy. And number two, how do you know he's going to get arrested? Get arrested yeah. And I challenged her, and she came out of the room with an arrest warrant. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And she okay. slammed it down in front of me. She says, here you go. So I have a tape where it's me verbatim. I said, what is this? She goes, read it. And I literally read it out loud for evidence purposes and audible. And I read it. United States of America versus James P. Castaldo, blah, 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 a.k.a. Jimmy Dirt. And they were going to arrest him on a Monday. And, and I said, how? What is this? I don't understand. And she goes, Be careful. I told you. I'm always looking out for you guys. So it turned out she was the leak the whole time. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. Uh and Jimmy Dirt was a was a serious individual. Uh back in the 90s, he took a case where uh in addition to the racketeering, he uh was charged with attempted murder, trying to solicit the murder of his secretary, who he felt knew too much and went through some Russian gangsters. It never happened, but this was a, yeah. but this was amazing. I, I, I really uh, am thrilled with the, the, the story you just told our audience and, and colored up so much uh, amazing. Um, just the way that you tell it, the narrative, the, the, the way that we can kind of get into the nooks and crannies of the trade craft while still touching up against, you know, you know, the kind of big names that, that people will recognize. So just let everyone know about what's going on at the Ma Museum. You know, uh, me, that's Giovanni and I, I think we met in person for the first time through the museum. Oh. We had known each other, uh, you know, through phone calls and emails before that. Yeah, I met you when you did your, you spoke. You yeah, your I spoke, I did, a, I did a Black Mafia family uh, presentation. Actually, this week, Big Meats just got out of prison. Yeah. Um, just walked out uh, and is uh, re reassimilating as we speak. Right. So uh, yeah, that's when I, m I met Giovanni in person. And so just tell everyone about the podcast and and what's yeah. going on there. Yeah, I mean, I, I I had authored a book, Giovanni's Reign, My Life Inside the Real Sopranos, and a lot of people ask me like, why why would you write a book and come out? Well, I just saw what was going on. Well, you know, everything with the law enforcement and the way they were being treated. I just felt it was the time to step up for the mental health and, and all this cancel culture stuff. So I had authored the book and I, I, I wanted it to be a teaching component, but actually people just want to hear the mafia stuff. So when I had authored the book, um, I did my, my first 
public speaking thing when I was came out, right? When I finally decided to come out and, and uh, promote the book, my first event was at the museum. So I built a relationship with the museum. As you know, we're on the advisory board for the museum, yourself and me. Yeah. And um, so from that point, my relationship just grew with them. And then they came to me with an opportunity to host a podcast. So we developed it uh, for a couple of years and we have season one. It was a wrap and it's already out and it's on Spotify, YouTube. You know, you can watch it, listen to it. Um, InsideTheLife.org is the website. And the museum is great because it's an educational component. It's just, it's not just mob stories and war stories. There's some kind of, um, you know, we have stories of redemption, stories of guys like Javier Pena, who was Narcos, you know, DEA agent who took down Pablo Escobar and Steve Murphy. Um, great guys, you know. Um, guys that did the, the pizza connection, guys that did the uh, took on John Gotti, John Gotti, the, the attorney, John Gleason. He was a guy that took John Gotti down and put him in prison. Um, you know, we had some Patty Norton, who was a, a undercover for years. Yeah, we, people from OG kid. know Patty. She's a Dude, friend of the show. I Great. Mean, One of the pioneers of female uh, undercover work in, in the feds. The females, right? Like just yeah. so much to glean and learn from them and hear the stories, not just ours and my, my co-host, Dutch, he, he does it with me. Dutch, who was in the case with me and helped me out on a lot of things and vice versa. Shout so out to Dutch cool. McAlpine. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a way for us to share stories. Um, stories of redemption. We've had some guys from our life come on and, you know, share their stories of how they, they were in organized crime. And we look forward to season two. We just started filming season two for it. So uh, and, and the museum does such a great job, right? If you haven't visited the museum, you have to, right? It's the, it, it's really turned in, and I know we're we sound like we're uh, you know uh, shilling, but it's it's true. I w- I'd be saying this whether I was affiliated with the museum or not. It is really outside of the traditional stuff you're going to see on the strip. It really is the premier tourist attraction right now in that area outside of the Hoover dam and outside of, you know, the traditional strip stuff, you're not going to find anything cooler, more informative, more fun than going to spend an afternoon or a morning or an evening, uh, at the mom museum on, uh, down, uh, downtown. Yeah. Amen to that. You know, and it's the, the, it's the museum of organized crime and law enforcement now. So they highlight and it's great. They don't glorify organized crime. The teaching components are there for it. You know, they, they honor the victims of, of the wrath of organized crime as well. They, they do such a good job of balancing and just being very neutral and telling the stories. Um, and I'll just I'll say this, uh, having consumed some of the episodes and seen behind the scenes of the production. And and I'm not this is not hyperbole. The production value of was it 12? Yeah, the first season have 12. Yeah, 12 episodes. So the 12 episodes in the first season, the production value on those episodes, the in terms of podcasting in this space, you're you're not going to find anything better. No, this okay. exceeds any type of production value expectations. It's it's like you're watching it on Netflix uh or you know HBO. I mean, it, it's so well done from a production standpoint. And that's not even talking about substantively right. so i just think that the audience would really enjoy because i i don't feel like for whatever reason i don't feel like the pod, the the pod that you've done the inside the life of the mom museum i don't know if it's really made the rounds with certain people that are really into that stuff and i want to spread the word and just tell you that you will not be disappointed with each one of these episodes from both a production standpoint and obviously from the substantive standpoint, but from, from visuals and, and aesthetic and optics, it's, it's like you're in a movie theater. Thanks, a man. That means a lot coming from you, man, because yeah. you, you listen, you know, I'm not blowing smoke. You really are a subject matter expert. So coming Thank from you, you and you, you're not, you're no BS kind of guy. You would call it as you see it. So coming from you, it means a lot. But we're just, um, we're grass, like we're grassroots here. I mean, yeah. this is like me and my kitchen. Like, right. so what I'm saying is if you go and I'm interviewing you on Zoom, you know, hopefully yeah. one day soon we'll have those kind of resources ourselves. Yeah. But for what Giovanni is a part of and hosting, it's, it's just, it blows my mind. The level of production value you guys were able to blows my mind, you know, with I, with the knowledge that you guys bring. I can't believe they have us hosting it. You know, a lot yeah, of times we yeah. have to pinch ourselves because we were just nominated for two Signal Awards. You know, best trailer and best podcast in the in the, in the categories. So um, I think we made the next round into the finals for that. So 
you know, please follow us. And, and if you can vote for it and try to research the content, season two is going to be awesome. We just started filming season two and it's going to be really well. Dutch and I were getting used to being on the camera, right? Although we wore microphones and videos and we made videos. Right. We're Different really, kind. Different it's kind. very uncomfortable having all these cameras pointing yeah. at you, but I think we're getting used to it. And we're getting comfortable. Well, Thank you so much, Giovanni, for Thanks. giving us some of your time. You've done it all. You've said it all. Uh, we want you back on whenever you're you're one of these people that we just give like the golden ticket. You can come back oh, whenever man. you want. Uh, we'd love to uh, have you back on to, you know, whether talk about new stuff that you're doing or or just uh, analyze uh, OC stuff. Talk about the trade craft. Talk about your career. Thank you awesome. so much. Thanks, guy. You're a good friend. Thank you. I appreciate you. All right. Well, uh, we will see you next time on OG Pod. This was the first of a uh, a pretty hefty slate that we're going to roll out between now and New Year's with long form interviews after we took the first part of the fall off. We kicked it off with Giovanni. And I think this is a gold standard that we're going to have to live up to over these next couple months. Thank you to Benny behind the glass. Thank you to Giovanni uh, for joining us. I'm Scott Bernstein, OG Pod. Out. I'll see you next week.